it's our custom when we have the requirement to collaborate with so many that those who can't participate in these very short uh, but regularly schedule updates that they at least know what else is going on in the conversation. It does help move things on so people who are new to it or ongoing and simply because they're busy with other things, they have a sense of what the conversation was. So uh, how about you start, Mark, uh, explain what you do, and uh, then, then Jim and then Mike, and then we'll, we'll get moving. Go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry, Mark. Are you, uh, Jim? Are you able to hear Mark? No, I wasn't. It was gar all garbled and yeah, likewise. Hear it. Yeah, okay, Same Mark. Here. Okay, Mark. Uh, are you? How about you try and you may have to log out and log in again. My experience with this is that you just got a bad port or at least a lossy port. So um, what I'll do, Mark, if you could please log off and log in again, maybe we can get a better connection. We can continue. Um, why, so, okay, so how about Mike? You want to explain what you do there, uh, Mike Pepper, to Jim Costiva? Sure. So, like I said, I'm Mike Pepper. I'm the operations superintendent at the Central Power House. I've been here uh, about 35 years now, so uh, I maintain all operations in a power plant. Uh, so that's essentially what I do. I have a lot of experience with everything firehouse from the boilers, uh, state boiler inspectors, boiler codes, uh, NFPA, uh, work of everybody else on all the code issues here in the firehouse. So I'm kind of the go-to guy to get uh, get things taken care of around here. Well, I'm grateful for your, uh, your, uh, your, your time, Mike. Uh, I think also your colleague of the powerhouse is also on the board, um, Meredith. Is he, uh, have you, have you and Meredith been talking about what we're trying to do here? Uh, you mean Merrill? I'm sorry, Merrill, yeah. yes. Merrill uh, has had a couple of discussions with us. Uh, right now he's busy today next door and doing some commission water treatment project. Mm hmm Okay. But yeah, we've been in touch with each other, plus I know a couple of people up there in Michigan State, too, and I had a couple of discussions. Oh, did you? Oh, did you talk to Bob Ellerhorst? Yeah, a uh, little while back. I haven't talked to him lately, though. Okay. I will be seeing him at the uh, Big Ten and Friends Utility Conference coming up next month. I think it is. Okay, I'm going to send you there with a with a with a one page uh, with a one pager talking points and probably a link to a video clip to what where we're at with this approaching the state. Okay. Um, so that's Mike Pepper. Um, Mark, are you back again? Yes, I am. Can you hear me better now? Much better. Go ahead, Mark. Tell us what you do. Okay. I am a principal and uh, professional engineer. I'm a principal at Wist Janney Elsner. Um, our practice is in uh, troubleshooting problems with buildings, so our work is primarily on existing construction. Um, but kind of relevant to the conversation today, I have for the last two code cycles uh, served on the ad hoc code review committee for the State Bureau of Construction Codes. So reviewing the, uh, the building codes from ICC and uh, promulgating the, the rules, I guess offering advice to the director um, on what the rules should be that are the, the state building code. Now what's important also, did you not present at that BOMA conference uh, a, a few days ago? I did. I presented to the uh, BOMA, which is Building Owners and Managers Association, um, a co-presentation together with Wayne Jewell. Uh, Wayne is a uh, was the Southfield uh, uh, chief building official. Now he's up in Green Oaks Township. Um, he's been active for uh, a couple of decades with ICC, um, so he's a good resource on code-related issues, and we presented to uh, building owners and managers just kind of on uh, use of the code and some of the things currently happening with the building code. Okay. Did you mention anything about what U of M is trying to do? Uh, not in the presentation, but I did have discussions with the uh, 
uh, the president uh, of BOMA Metro Detroit about that. Okay, well, that'll be important because uh, Rich Robbins uh, said we, we have to uh, lower our expectations for working with MAPA and MIAPA on, on these kinds of issues, so that's why uh, I, I wanted to coordinate a little bit with you had there been time. First, let's get Jim Castiva. Uh, Jim, do you want to say a little something about what you, what you do here at U of M? Uh, I'm in the government relations office, been with the university for 20 years, and um, our, our government relations office represents the university at uh, federal, state, and local levels. Okay. So, all right. Well, uh, a lot has happened since last month, and because of the time constraint, I'm, and that's why I'm recording this, I'll, I'll bring you up to date as much as possible about the things that we have some control over. One of them, uh, and I'm, you know what, let me back up. I'm going to let you talk, Mark, while I pick away at my uh, email here so you can see. I would have had a more prepared presentation had I not spent nine hours driving, nine hours driving <laughs> from University of Michigan here to upstate New York. Um, Mark, uh, could you explain, uh, in, in light of the fact that we've struggled a bit, uh, it's, it's actually no accident, or it's, it's no surprise. Um, we're struggling with getting a strong user interest, or, or, or rallying our colleagues in uh, in the, elsewhere in the education industry to participate in uh, approaching the state for some modifications. We're not looking for drama, folks. We're looking for what, a, what in our mind, is rational. Um, rational changes to the state construction code, uh, one that brings it up to the time, and because we are arguably the second or third largest uh, uh, spender of money on new construction and renovations, that our voice ought to be heard here. So uh, perhaps, Mark, you could say a little bit, uh, uh, tell uh, Jim, because this is of a concern to Jim, about what you did, uh, what, what you did at the BOMA conference uh, and uh, just give us the sense of the atmospherics there. Go ahead, Mark. Well, my my presentation uh, to BOMA is was really just uh, an update, and yeah, actually, even there, we are trying to encourage uh, the building owners and and property managers to take a more active role in the co both the code development process, which I would say is you know primarily what the ICC does on a national level. Where they, you know, every three years they they put out a new a new set of building codes, and uh, then in the at the state of Michigan, um, every three years when those new uh, model codes come out, the state of Michigan reviews them and uh, adopts them, you know, in large part just the way they're promulgated by ICC with some local uh, modifications. Um, and uh, so we're trying to encourage the the BOMA people to to get involved. The, the national organization has uh, uh, you know has some resources that they use um, to try to affect the ICC code development process. So we're really looking for the local people to get involved with the uh, with the state and uh, you know making whatever modifications we feel are necessary here in the state. Mm -hmm. So I do think that at least at the national level, BOMA is fairly strong. Uh, I know yes. that they have a strong voice, obviously, in the International Building Code, and I expect that was, that's conveyed somewhat at the state level. Now, you know, we can talk about, about voices and who's the bigger organization, who has the bigger conferences. Uh, again, my particular discipline is, is results that show up on our first cost and our running cost. And that, that now starts to winnow the crowd down quite a bit. Uh, so you get beyond policy and you get into the nuts and bolts of temperature sensors and egress path widths and the number of stairwells and emergency lighting and backflow prevention lubricants and all that stuff that scares a lot of the policymakers away. So that's where things get difficult. It, it's a very quick winnowing, frankly. Uh, before I get into that, uh, there's two things I wanted you to know. One is that Jim Harvey just got on the call. Hi, Jim. Hi, Mike. Sorry for being late. I did I did 
recognize I was supposed to be on this thing until I got into the office. Well, I was, I was lonely for you, Jim. I figured uh, I'm going to need some witnesses, so I figured I want you to be able to uh, uh, stand up for me here. And the integrity of my purpose, <laughs> when I, which, which you always have when you're trying to do something just a little bit different in our industry. Uh, Jim, what you should see here, uh, I hope you won't mind that um, I'll just introduce you as my colleague of the uh, better part of 30 years. Uh, All right. Yeah, and Jim and I uh, co-founded a, uh, a new uh, committee within the, uh, let's see if I can find it here. You can see how many windows I have opened at any given time. I'm calling actually right now from the uh, Corning plant in upstate New York, and uh, I, I wanted to not let another month go by uh, without uh, letting everybody know that we, we, we have made uh, significant progress uh, and several levels here. Uh, just so you know, uh, Jim, Mike, and Mike Pepper, uh, Jim and I founded uh, what is now called the IEEE Education Healthcare Facility Electrical Technology Committee. Uh, this committee is, uh, is worldwide. We have uh, two teleconferences every other week, and we, um, uh, as you can see, we're casting a very wide net here. Uh, I've just started bringing to the attention of my electrical colleagues, for example, all the action that's happening in the non-IEEE world. So uh, in some sense, Jim, I'm trying to embarrass my IEEE colleagues by telling them that, uh, frankly, you're not writing the rules the way you think you are. And actually, ASHRAE has appropriated themselves the design of, of interior lighting systems. So that much said, that's what Jim and I do. Uh, we had one yesterday. We had four people from uh, two different continents on it, and it, I consider it successful. But that's what Jim and I are doing. It's important because back here on our core, the project that we're talking about now, that some of those electrical rules uh, we developed at the national level will be conveyed into our electrical administrative board. Okay, so the new information, um, and I guess I'll comment mostly on what Mark had said, and I know this is a sensitive issue for Jim, so I thought it would have Give, have Jim have a chance to talk about it, is that we are not, get, uh, oh, let me go back to where I was before, we're not getting, uh, uh, let's put it this way, man hour response out of my APA, uh, but we are uh, getting their, we are getting their um, uh, contribution toward that research project that um, the, uh, let's see if I can show it to you, that NFPA research project that I've been working on for some, for a better part of two years now. If I, uh, if I, they have contributed, here we are, okay, so about a year and a half ago I only had 25 percent and now 18 months later I have 70 percent of the funding. So I give a great credit and thanks to the MIAPA, the MIAPA uh, governing board for contributing to this project. In Courtney, New York now, I'm working with General Electric and Schneider and a couple other agencies that understand the, necess the necessity for this project. Uh, and without question, they know that this is, this will be the largest contribution of any, in any industries, any universities, sustainability program. This is likely to be the largest permanent change you can make to the way we build our facilities. But it's very difficult for us because we have to compete with glossier, more marquee style sustainability programs. There's no way not to be, there's no way not to be frank about that. That's how much meaningful, how meaningful that particular change is. To get our building electrical systems uh, rationalized what the, the actual energy demand is and to make them safer. So that much said, I'm going to let Jim talk a little bit about, uh, in light of the fact that I have gotten the financial support of of my APA, but what we have not done is been able to get the uh, the, the national group to, to be to contribute in any meaningful way to uh, in any meaningful way into any of these codes, including International Code Council. APA put together a standards council uh, last year, and they had a hundred attendees. And when it all comes down to it, if you look at the transcripts that ICC put out, the ones that are going to be used in the monograph in uh, two weeks from now in Memphis, there was one. One concept got put out by the national organization. 
So I'm going to let that speak for itself. Uh, we know how it's being managed at the moment. I don't want to go into details there. That may not be their mission. And they're entitled to say, well, maybe this is a lot harder than we thought. So I wanted to serve that those new facts to you, Jim, for you to comment on, because I know that the University of Michigan's position is one that feels that we have to re rely solely upon the trade associations for support for what we're doing. So any thoughts, Jim? Comments? Jim Harvey or Jim Castiva? I'm sorry, Jim Castiva. Jim, Jim Castiva. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, I, this is Jim Harvey. I, I, I got on the phone call late, and I got a, another meeting in 10 minutes I got to get beat to, but uh, I hate to come in late and run. I'll, be, I'll stay on for a few minutes, but I got to leave for another meeting in a few minutes. Okay. I was, the call was actually, the question was to Jim Castiva, who's our government relations person. Go ahead, Jim. Jim. Yeah. Well, you know, the, um, um, one of the important elements that we've, I've stressed, you know, throughout our efforts is that this has got to be demonstrated here in the state of Michigan um, as an effort beyond the University of Michigan, that we, it's, it's of vital importance that uh, that there be other large institutions, other universities, whether it be a large healthcare institutions um, or other public owners. Uh, I, I'd be I'm interested to hear from uh, you know from Mark about are are the building owners um, seeing the same kind of long-term cost impacts of these onerous code provisions, um, and is it you know, raising a concern for them. This has to be uh, an effort when we bring this to the attention of state building you know, uh, code officials or the, the smaller boards of electrical boilers and, and other um, uh, parochial uh, you know, board, uh, rulemaking boards, this has to be an effort with a, a much broader base. Go ahead, Mark. Are you able to hear us, Mark? Hmm. Mark Kruger, are you still on the line, on the call? Oh, yep, I'm here. I'm sorry. I guess I put myself on mute. Um, Go ahead. Um, yes, I. Uh, the building owners are aware, and you know, especially the national organization has, you know, put together some of the numbers of how how much some of these code provisions cost their their constituency, and. Uh, um, so yeah, they are aware that there are some very significant costs for some of these these code changes that that get promulgated uh, um, at the national level, and uh, you know, then sometimes adopted state. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. And then yeah, generally they get adopted at the state level unless unless someone speaks up uh, against them. So. Uh, um, and so, our yeah, they, they are aware of that. And our problem, Mark, is that the other universities aren't. Right. Well, it's, and it's not just a university. But I mean, the uh, the building owners um, also, I think, have have a fair amount of difficulty trying to to generate uh, enough interest, enough bodies to uh, to spend time doing the, uh, right. the you know, making the contacts that they need to make. Um, mm -hmm. What we have here, gentlemen, is what's called, I think, microeconomics is the free rider problem. Uh, I'm not an economist by training, but uh, there's a considerable amount of literature on the free rider problem. It, I think it's taught to uh, it's taught in most introductory uh, uh, economics courses as one that's so prevalent. It's so prevalent that you know one organization or one entity. Uh, <laughs> look at there's no shortage of economic. Uh, one of these, there's like there's, there's there's several hundred YouTube clips which I'm using to validate the sense. Uh, what, what, what the claim is that the University of Michigan is is putting up the capital uh, to make a code change, and then everybody else will benefit from it. It's not unlike uh, as they use the uh, they they use the example of everyone using the fire department. Uh, and there are some conditions upon how you formally define the free rider problem, but that's what we're up against. That's what we're up against. Now, MIAPA has uh, contributed money to uh, the, the larger project, and for them, I, I'm very grateful. But you, it couldn't be clearer. I don't expect this, frankly, to change. 
because there are structural reasons why the trade associations can't do that. I, I did prepare, since, this, uh, since our last uh, teleconference, I did prepare a video uh, that explains why fun trade associations fundamentally uh, struggle with trying to uh, promote anything other than their own business interest, which is conferences, uh, revenue associated with uh, registration, hotel rooms, uh, corporate sponsorships and such of nature. So, and App is not alone. I see it in IEEE. I think uh, Jim, you and I are involved in that uh, planning of the uh, the Detroit conference. Uh, you can see some of the uh, commercial uh, content at this point <laughs> has taken second place to uh, trying to make sure we've got a viable commercial prospect when we have our uh, when we have our conference in Detroit. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, it's not here. Uh, I'm not picking an app or my app or any of those. I'm just saying that that's the nature of the 501c3 uh, or 501c3 organizations. And I'm sitting in here with about 50 of them right now. I'm sitting next to my counterparts at, at Boeing and, and, and General Electric and Siemens and the, uh, the, the Defense Department. And uh, I'm sitting next to the, the top cyber guy. And they're all talking about the same problem. So in any case, but that's our system. And ANSI provides. Uh, what I call the thin blue line between uh, an industry's ability to govern itself and total government fiat. And not even the government wants total government fiat. I'll, let me assure you of that. So, um, okay, so we are coming on our time constraint. I did want to let you know that uh, we have retained David Flint, who is going to be uh, attending all the elevator safety board meetings. And there is, and the gym, this is probably going to be important to you, so I've, I've cut a piece of his letter out. There's a legislator that wants to privatize all of elevator inspections. And we think that we might have a better idea uh, that would not only save the university money, but one that would uh, save most of the colleges and universities money, all those larger colleges and universities that have elevator shops. So we probably will need to talk separately on that one. Uh, uh, okay. Jim, as we uh, as Dave comes back, in fact, I will uh, I will uh, I'll roll you into our next. I meet with him biweekly, and you can understand what we're trying to do. Um, but whenever we yes. see that there's a legislator involved, we're right. We're, yeah, and if, exactly. And 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 well, once there's a legislator involved in this kind of manner, it maybe gives us an opportunity to make a small bite of the apple. Yeah, right. So that's why. Yep. So, I'll find on my calendar where that uh, where that particular uh, uh, I think it's every other Wednesday, and if not, we'll just meet with him separately. But he's on re hourly retainer, so I have to be mindful of my uh, advocacy budget. So I give Rich credit for uh, being uh, fourth. Uh, I believe this is a, a really a, an excellent use of the university resources in, in retaining uh, J uh, Dave Flint. Hopefully, we'll have, be able to do the same thing with Jim Harvey. Now, Mike, you've been patient on the call. And I wanted to let you know that we have the the boiler board now. I, not Merrill, I'd like no, you. Really? Merrill, yeah. uh, your next meeting is in June. And I have a letter that has gone to all of the other boards, and one that says we would like to revisit the Public Act 290, and. We, we're not going in there with uh, all flags flying and, 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 and throwing bombs and all that other ugly stuff. We're going softly. We've been doing this for the better part of two years now, acclimating all of these boards to the concept that we'd like to see some adjustments. And in particular, I believe we may be approaching uh, the boiler board on labor classifications. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is there any? Uh, do you see any? Um, I'll call it irrationality in labor classifications, or do you see any opportunities where we could use our resources more wisely if we were to allow a more liberal allocation of work? This is a question to you, Mike. Really offhand, Mike, I can't answer that. I'd have to really think about that and talk to. Uh, my cohorts here, Glenn Thieke, you know Glenn Thieke, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Jim Watterson, also another person here in the powerhouse, is basically he takes care of our boilers on the maintenance side. Let me talk to those other 
other people also. I did want to tell you, Mike, that basically you know Simpies, don't you? Southeastern uh, the Southeastern Michigan Power Plant Engineers Society. Have you ever heard of it? No, but I, it looks like I just have. So we meet once a month. I'm a member. I don't go every month. I only go when it's appropriate. It covers areas of, uh, of interest for myself. April 16th, uh, David Stenoz, which is Assistant Boiler Chief for the State of Michigan, is going to be there along with Keith Lambert, which is the Deputy Director of Construction Codes from the Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs. Well, can you, get, can you get to that meeting and say we want to talk to them about uh, possibly yeah. loosening a little bit. Now, I'm taking this idea. This has inspired some comments made, my, made to me by one of our colleagues at another large university. He felt that the boiler, uh, construction boiler, certification boiler, inspection boiler, that there was some overlap. He had some concern about the way the rules, the state of Michigan rules were applied to the maintenance of boilers. I don't think there was as much of a problem with the construction, but I think there was a problem right. with the maintenance and the labor classifications for maintenance. If you could draft something for me, a discussion topic, I can uh, now do you want me to talk to Mr. Lambert, which is the director of, or deputy director of construction codes, or a combination with the assistant boiler chief also? I talk because I'm going to be meeting him. I'm going to introduce myself to him. I've already met the state. I uh, already met the new chief uh, boiler chief for the state of Michigan at one of the SMP uh, meetings a few okay. months back. So here's where I can easily get in trouble. Um, <laughs> I'll, uh, since this is a recorded phone call, I'll explain to you where these ideas came from. Remember, some people give me ideas. I don't validate them enough. This is not my area of expertise. I do know that right. because labor votes, labor tends to have a larger influence in uh, state codes. Let me say that a different way. I can do all I can at the product level the way substations are built, the way boilers are built, that's a product. How, and that can be done easily away from the labor pool. But labor does vote. And labor is, labor is also tw almost twice the cost of our product in, in many cases. Yep. Rule of thumb, labor is twice the cost. So if I'm going to make any headway in there, I'd like to rationalize labor a little bit. But there are a lot of political sensitivities around labor that uh, we need to be mm. mindful of. Somebody wanted to talk. Was that you, Mark? No, I, that was Jim Castiva here. Mm -hmm. I noticed on the boiler, um, on the boiler board, there is a gentleman by the name of Ryan Randazzo who is appointed to at least represent the interests of owners and users. Um, he is the uh, he's the the maintenance and production manager at the Trenton Channel Power Plant for DTE, um, and whether or not it be worthwhile to at least have a uh, re request an appointment and sit down with Ryan and and at least begin to share and give him you know support <coughs> that other owners and users um, are looking for a good strong voice on the uh, on the boiler board that's right we should always take our ideas and put them through the voices that are already there that are already there you got somebody sitting at the table yep yeah yeah. I have not met uh, Ryan yet, I don't think. I've only been in front of the State Boiler Board on about three or four occasions over the years. I have not been really that active in the last few years because I went from plant superintendent to operations superintendent. Had a little bit of organizational change here, but I'm really the only person here at the CPP, along with Glenn Zeke, that's had any, any experience of sitting in front of the State Boiler Board. So that's the reason why I uh, sat in on this conference today to try to get myself up to speed what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Uh, uh, getting together with Brian, being a being a, uh, a spokesperson for us. One of the things we do, uh, as, uh, Mike. Basically, uh, I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable having any discussion with Mr. Lambert or Mr. Stenos at the Simpies meeting because I'm really not up to speed on the discussion topics. I could really bring up something that I don't have much answers for until I get myself more up to speed on this. Yeah, that's but fair. If there's, if there's anything I can do in the future, uh, by all means, and I'll keep me informed on these uh, teleconferences and everything, I'm going to try to maintain these myself so I, I can stay up, I'd stay up with you guys. Okay. Well, these are just the regularly scheduled ones, Mike, and I, we can talk off-site early uh, next week if you like when I get back. Uh, sure. Specifically, uh, I will tell you right off the bat. This looks like it's a, a, this board. This board here looks a little bit better balanced. 
Uh, now, very often you'll find sometimes owners and users means a trainer, a trainer, a person who uses the book to train other boiler, uh, boiler journeymen, for example. So we have to be mindful that uh, every, every organization will determine what a user is. And along those lines, just to let you know, I just did a, uh, I just did a uh, clip on this last week, uh, 30 minutes explaining how uh, somebody who's using the book as, a instructor, as an instructor uh, probably does, is not, uh, even though they're a user because they just bought the book to, to teach out of, is generally not somebody who is, uh, would have the same economic interest as someone who is running uh, 60 megawatts of boilers. Right. Well, that's a yeah, big difference. Yeah. Yep. So, um, well, we are running a time constraint. Uh, gentlemen, and what I uh, so to let's just to let you know uh, where I'll go from here, Jim. We'll have an in-between meeting with David Flint, and we'll see how far they are with this. Uh, whatever I think it's in the southeastern, southwestern part of the state, and he can bring us up to date. If you don't mind, Jim, I'll I will copy you on the correspondence that Dave, uh, where Dave mentions uh, this particular uh, legislator, and so okay, uh, you yeah, can, and I'll take a I'll take a look at. What's been in it, what's been introduced, and see if there is uh, uh, I can, we can get a, a, an update on the status of the legislation. Okay, good. What Rich yep. Robbins' idea is that we would rather than privatize it, it might be more effective. Uh, we may not save as much money, but it might be more effective for us if we simply certify our own elevator inspectors. And there, we already have precedent for that because we're already doing it with our fire alarm shop, and so that legislator. You know, that legislature is probably subject to political forces, as you can imagine. I'm sure private industry would like to take this part of the work. So, our, our, again, all our job is we're trying to do our diligence and using the process to make, our, to make things. As I I'll always end the call the same way I start them. This is what we do. We're in the business of making things safer, simpler, lower cost, and longer lasting. Anything, uh, anything else you want to add, uh, Mark? You've been kind of quiet. I, no, him, I don't think I have anything else to add. Okay, how does next, uh, I, I set aside next May 20th as, uh, is that a reasonable uh, time for us to, to update it? That, that this is a regularly scheduled update again. Remember, we can always talk in between time, but uh, for uh, uh, the possibility of a, of a multi-person conference, is May 20th uh, a good time? Looks good to me. Does it? Okay, so I'm going to set that at, uh, well, that's a void of uh, mechanical rules, excuse me. <laughs> Let's see, well, you know what I do is I give the same project number. I'm going to set it at, uh, that's, that's going to be a general event, so I'm going to set that at 10 a.m. again, and I'll send, uh, I don't want to clog people's email. Uh, I'll, I'll put this up as a record of our work on the website, but I don't want to annoy people with too many email. They, they already get too much email from me. I get too much email from me. So, okay, guys. Thanks very much for your time, gentlemen. All right. Well, 10 a.m. Bye, Mike. And this recording will be up on the website too. Yeah. Bye, bye. Thank you, Mike. Yeah.